Boom, 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 baby. Uh, happy Saturday to you. Sorry, I'm just a little late. We we're doing a little final little adjusting there, but we are here and we are back. I hope you are having an amazing Saturday and an amazing weekend so far. My name is Don Terrell, and I want to welcome you to another amazing episode of The Color of Motion, where I like to say, hey, stories come in all shades, and I highlight people of color and diverse backgrounds in the industry of motion graphics, animation, visual effects, cartoons, and comics, this space that uh, I'm just ecstatically crazy about. Uh, today is a special day. You got a two for one today. We got two family members coming back and uh, gracing us with their presence here and updating us with what's been happening with them. So super, super excited about that. Mr. Didwan, appreciate you tuning in there. Happy Saturday to you. Thank you so much for stopping by. It's going to be a great episode uh, for sure. Uh, make sure that uh, you hop on over to the Facebook group community, get plugged in, uh, facebook.com slash group slash the color of motion. Definitely don't want you to miss out on any of information, upcoming episodes or anything like that. Uh, we're having a lot of fun, so definitely make sure that you get plugged in because we're always wanting our family to grow. So again, hop on over to facebook.com slash groups slash the color of motion uh what else also uh make sure that uh, you hop on over to the store the store is open we have a lot of swag there uh you can pick you up some gear uh we have a lot of great shirts hoodies mugs constantly putting stuff uh on the in the shop there so definitely don't want you uh, to miss out on anything like that, uh, for sure. You know, my goal is to see as many people with the color of motion stuff on and gear as possible. My only request is that if you pick you up something, make sure you take a picture of yourself, send it on over to me uh, so we can share it on the show, in the group, in the community, and give you a plug. Like I said, I got a couple of new ones that people have sent to me that I'm going to uh, share out this week. Uh, but definitely we have a lot of great stuff over there uh, for you to pick up. Also, uh, you can connect with me uh, on all my social channels right here. Definitely want to hear from you. Uh, always like to hear from the viewers. Let me know, you know how the show is going, what I can do to kind of improve it. I'm constantly working to make this the best possible show that I can make it, and I can't do it without you the viewers kind of giving me some great feedback on things uh, for sure. Also, uh, like I said, we're here each and every Saturday, 3 p.m. Central Time, <laughs> uh, live on the YouTube channel, LinkedIn, uh, the Facebook group, and the website for the show. But I always encourage everybody to hop on over to the YouTube channel, uh, get plugged in, uh, subscribe, bell um, and comment because it helps the algorithm um, and there you're able to check out all the other past great guests that we've had on the show so far so hop on over to uh, again yep 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 like I said I am super super excited about this uh, episode I'm always happy like I said when uh, family members come back onto the show and uh you know, update us with what's been happening with them. We got a lot, a lot to talk about as well. Don't think I'm missing anything else, but uh, I feel like I am. I always feel like I'm missing on something, but we're ready to, uh, I think, ready to uh, kind of rock and roll here. So without further ado, I think we can uh, kind of get this show on the road here.
Yes, yes, yes. We are back and ready to get this one kicked off. Like I said, today, we have a two for one today. We got two amazing, super talented guests and family members coming back onto the show. Uh, and I know you're going to love this episode. Been looking forward to it for a long, long while, uh, for sure. Miss Maggie, appreciate you tuning in. Hello, hello, hello. Hope you're staying cool. I hope everybody's, well, at least down in the southern states. I don't know how it is up north. But down here, we are frying. I'm here in Houston. So it's been extremely, extremely hot this way. So I think the whole southern uh, hemisphere is feeling it. Mr. Kevin, appreciate you tuning in, uh, as always. Uh, Mr. Demille, happy Saturday to you there, brother. I appreciate you stopping by uh, for sure. So, without further ado, uh, let's get this show on the road. Uh, one of my first guests, uh, Miss Aubrey Eden Dukes, she has been drawing and painting since she was a wee, wee, wee child. From scrawling on the walls in Magic Marker to eventually more sophisticated digital methods, a small indicator that she's always known she's wanted to draw for a living. She attended two years of university before coming to the Art Institute of L.A., Santa Monica, where she got her Bachelor of Science in Men Media Arts and Animation. As a result, she's worked in the film animation industry for the past 16-plus years, spanning from pre-production, storyboarding, visual development, illustration, and design work, to post-production, compositing, stereo conversion, localization, and is currently at Powerhouse Animation as a compositor effect artist in for The Blood of Zeus, which I really like. As expansive as the industry is, she's had the pleasure and privilege of working on some of the biggest film franchises of our generation with Marvel, the closing of the Star Wars saga, and beyond. Though compositing is where she spent most of her career, drawing and illustration has always been her passion, and she continues to freelance as much as possible. My other guest, Mr. An Enrique Torres, is an Emmy Award-winning artist with over 20 years' experience in the entertainment industry. His position varied from VFX artist, VFX supervisor, game artist, concept artist, character designer, storyboard artist, animator, caricature artist, compositor, art director, stereographer, and creative director. Currently, Enrique is the creative director of the 3D and matte painting department for top ad agency called Bond which is located near Hollywood. Some of the projects Bond has worked on and been involved are Little Mermaid, Dune 1 and 2, Blue Beetle, which I'm looking forward to coming out, Mortal Kombat, Guardians of the Galaxies, Volume 3, House of the Dragons, The Batman, Kong vs. Godzilla, Borderlands, Battlefield 2024, WWE 2000, just to name a few. Everybody, that was a mouthful. Everybody, please help me welcome uh, my very special guests and uh, friends, Enrique and Aubrey. No. <laughs> <laughs> Enrique, Aubrey, I am super, super happy to have you back on the show. Like I said, you know, I always love uh, when family members come back uh, on the show and just grace us with their, their presence. A lot's been happening and going on uh, since we've last talked. I was looking. Uh, Enrique was in season one, episode 13. And Aubrey was uh, episode 37, kind of in season two, just getting started in season two. Like I said, I was telling, we were talking beforehand. 
it's it's we're on 129 right now so we've been going for a little <laughs> bit uh but again like i said i just love when family members come back on the show and and just really share uh so thank you thank you both for coming on um and and having a sit down with me absolutely super excited to be back um, yeah thank you very much for having us here and, and thank for everybody uh watching and joining yes I, and like thank I you said, enrique for showing me up <laughs> with your Emmy award winning <laughs> career. <laughs> yeah, Aubrey was, saying, Aubrey was saying when she saw the, the ad for the show, he said he, Enrique had to had to have his Emmy in there. And I was saying, well, I don't think I've gotten a picture where it hasn't been in. Or <laughs> so he's super proud of hey, his Emmy award. Somebody <laughs> right behind me. It's not a big deal. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. man. Uh, well done. <laughs> like I said, uh, and, and I'm super proud. We're all super proud of it as well. And, and Enrique and I were kind of talking about uh, a lot of stuff just before, you know, the episode stuff. A lot of stuff's been going on in between uh, the times you've been on the show uh, and just super looking forward to kind of diving into just some of the things that's been going on. Um, specifically, like I said, I don't think we, either of us, uh, had the conversation of AI when you were, either of you were on this show. Um, and that's been, uh, yeah. obviously a big, big topic, um, in our industry. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what your thoughts are on it. You know, I've, you know, heard it both ways, you know, people on both sides of the aisle about it. Uh, but really curious to hear both of your thoughts on AI and, you know, kind of how it's impacted just the things that you're doing. Uh, we'll let ladies go first. Aubrey, what are your, what are your thoughts? <laughs> on, you know, yeah, on I mean, it's a, it's a heated topic, right? Um, I'm, I'm of the mindset. I mean, we already see how it's, it's, you know, getting into the industry in a way um, that is, I, I'm, against it personally like i think ethically there's a big problem with the way that this this technology has been um you know scraping images off the internet taking people's work without consent yeah. um i think it was released into the wild pretty recklessly and prematurely like i there's been a ton of uh you know artists out there speaking up about like not wanting their stuff stolen um losing jobs to it you know, we've, we've seen a lot of stuff out there where there's, you know, people looking to studios looking to save a buck. Um, I think the long term effect of AI is a worrisome one, not only in the sense that it can take work away from the artists, but we kind of are in this period of time where deadlines are exceedingly like aggressive. Yeah. And introducing something like AI, I think, just feeds that problem more because it gives the idea that, oh, if you push a button, which is the goal of this kind of technology, right, is to push yeah. a button and have a product, you know, spit out the other side. In doing that, it, it kind of feeds into this like, oh, we can get work done like that. Yeah. And I think that's a big problem when it's just like you want art to be authentic you want, you know, obviously we, we're all artists. We want to be able to express ourselves as much as we can with through our passions. And when you introduce something like this, I think it, it just feeds into a problem. Like it's here. I don't know if it's ever going to go away. Yeah. There's been a lot of people that, you know, Carlo Ortez went to Congress to, to speak about this, where it's like there needs to be regulations about it. If we're going to have it here, then there needs to be some serious safeguards around it so that the people who are, contributing to it like it's done ethically right yeah, and yeah. we're you know and enrique uh like i said we you know touched a little bit on on this and before the you know before the show started what are your thoughts uh before we dive into this mashup conversation about it what are your kind of thoughts uh and take on it <laughs> yeah so from, <laughs> from a uh, uh, a uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, get too <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I guess I'll be speaking from the industry I'm 
the advertising industry I'm in, it's like, it's going full force. It's something we have to implement in our end. <clears throat> so from my spectrum is like, there, there are obviously still legal ramifications we have to go through when we're doing design. So right now we're, we're using it just as a tool, uh, uh, you know, uh, just like, you know, we're not going to take full advantage of replacing artists or anything like that in our end right now is something that help us to <clears throat> to use as you know no different than a digital brush in photoshop or something like that so that that part i have been playing around with it and it's been working very well um but you know as as what we spoke uh earlier it's just like how when 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 people were uh designers from that were making uh logos and airbrush you know i mean using airbrush when photoshop came around people were like oh this is going to ruin the art industry and now it's just photoshop is just a tool and, and we were talking about like how traditional animation mm -hmm. was hated 3d and that was going to kill the 3d uh that that traditional animation experience but that you know uh but that didn't happen it's it's just something that we're gonna people are going to uh just learn to use that as a tool. But at the same time, I do agree with what you're saying, Aubrey, there will be more uh, legal, you know, ramifications coming in the future. I do believe about, yeah. you know, there, there's still that, that, that split between there's people that are online and we we're talking about Don claiming that they're artists and they have an art page <laughs> and all they're showing is AI and say, look, I'm an artist, check out my art. And I'm like, no, that's not, Hey, uh, that's not art. You just they learn the and, skill of of writing prompts. Uh, yeah, writing life. prompts, writers, and like <clears throat> things that we do using it is just using it to um, help us uh, to you know. It's not really to. We still have to design the idea. We still have to create the product uh, from our own hands. It's mainly uh, we just like I said. It's just mostly as much as we use it as a tool to help us. Uh, like you said, I'll be make the quicker deadlines and, and, and do things a lot faster so we could be more aggressive. It's, yeah, it's one of those things that the industry is uh, going to use from, from here on then. So it's hopefully, you know, I, I think we're just going to make the best of it and it's going to evolve as, as uh, we all seen where new technology comes in, yeah, where yeah. It, it will be safe to use and people will be using it. I think, um, and like I said, you know, we, we touched a little bit on this, you know, as we were talking about, you know, before the show. One, I will say, it's not going anywhere. So as an artist, I think you need to learn how, and for me, it's a tool, just like Photoshop is a tool, um, just like, you know, a, a Wacom pad is a tool. Um, and I think it should be looked at as a tool that aids in, the creation process or makes your process, whatever it is that you're doing easier, better, more efficient. Now, like any tool, there are always going to be people that use it the wrong way. A car is a tool that gets you from point A to point B, but people in the wrong hands, it could be a very dangerous thing. A gun is a tool like any other tool in the hands of a wrong person or a person that, means to use it with malintent is going to use it that way um i will say though it's in again this was kind of something that we were talking about i was telling in enrique that i was listening to um tom billy's podcast impact theory and he had on there and i i can't think of his name but he was one of the uh ai creators from google that i guess stepped down because he was telling people, hey, we need to kind of approach this very, you know, slowly, you know, and, and him and a handful of creators weren't, were kind of caught by surprise at just the speed at which AI was put out there and people were just grabbing onto it. Um, but he was saying, hey, we need to take a step back to really look at all the implications of what can be, this could be used for because he was getting into, and, and we've just only been touching on it on the art side, 
he was talking about politics. He was talking about how it could yeah, be used. Yeah, it's a message. dangerous tool. It's it's, very, I don't see it as a tool. Personally. Yeah, it's a very, well, I think, like I said, I've seen it used in very creative ways. Um, and, and I think of, and I'm talking about just Photoshop. Photoshop's had Sensei for a while, which is their AI tool. I would much, it makes the process of, I would much rather have their artificial AI sensei do a selection for me in, in a much easier and quicker way than me having to do a path. That's where I mean where as a tool that's used to make your process easier and make what you're doing easier, I see it for like, because uh, it's going to touch a lot of different, it's going to touch every industry. As a creator, you could use it AI to give you, prompt you with ideas. I think most people are making the mistake of whatever it spits out, that's my creation and, and that's what it, 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 it's gonna run with. But as a writer, you could use AI to generate ideas, okay, and go back and forth with it and kind of refine your idea of what it, you know, what you're wanting it to do as opposed to okay, just write me a screenplay on this with these characters and this and that and that and that, and it spits it out, and then you just run with it and take it to the studio. Hey, this is a movie. Now, I think, like, what kind of you touched on, Aubrey, there's going to be a lot of execs out there that are going to try and see how they can use it to make, a, you know, their a buck faster or more money cut processes. There's all, Like I said, there's always going to be people that are going to use it the way it wasn't intended to be used. I think it as an ideation tool, it's I think it's a great thing. As a tool that makes, you know, your process easier. Like I said, you could say the same thing about Sensei software. Well if I what? may though, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I no, think it's no. just the the thing that's difficult about AI is this is there's been a lot of arguments about it there's um about how it can be used as ideas right like but the the biggest problem with it is how it's doing this you know this isn't me feeding it my own stuff and saying this is my art yeah. that i am feeding into the data set give me based on my own stuff it's taking it's the ethical aspect right it's writers it's musicians it's artists who have had their whole catalog of work taken completely without their consent and without their knowledge yeah and that's being fed into so it's the ethical issue of like how can i say like oh these these ideas i have these ideas but this is using this is directly using another artist's piece of work like there's been samples of how the original artist's signature is still in some of this stuff yeah. you know I, my my sister um, used to teach uh, English as a second language in her courses. Um, she talked about, she's no longer teaching um, in, in the educational field. She's, she's moved on elsewhere, but there's been some really interesting arguments just in education, how, you know, like you said, this spans so many different industries. Like the artist part of it is such a small piece, yeah. but how, you know, professors are finding it difficult to distinguish between what is my student's work versus yeah. what is uh, chat GPT. Like, yeah. you know, like it's really hard to distinguish and that oversaturates and pollutes the pool of art out there because like I could not get hired tomorrow because someone, you know, I'm, I'm small potatoes. Like I'm using myself as an example, but like I could not get hired tomorrow because someone's like, oh, I want to produce something that looks just like Aubrey's work. There's a difference between me saying like, hey, if you want to, like we all did this growing up, where it's like we yeah. picked up our favorite comic books and we copied what they did because you're trying to learn. That's different from an AI. An AI is not a person. Yeah. A prompt is not an idea. It's something we're putting in there to cut and paste from these pieces of work and make something new. And that was a big conversation around uh, Invasion, right? They found out that that whole title sequence was done using AI mm -hmm. and a big part of the industry boycotted the show, which is a shame in the sense of, you know, a lot of people worked on that. And now there's this tainted atmosphere around it because the title sequence was generated using AI. Um, 
you know, it's it's really tough and it's dangerous because it can spit out stuff so in, so instantaneously. Yeah. You know, like it's one thing. It's always been a fight in the artist community that someone's art is being stolen. This is that same problem, but on a massive scale. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to fight that. It is. And like I said, I, I don't see it. I really don't see it going anywhere. I, I kind of fall on the, the side of what the coder was talking about is, hey, we need to take a step back and really s take a gl holistic look at how this is going to impact on a lot of different areas. Like you were just saying, Aubrey, art is a very you know small little section of what AI is going to touch. Um, and again, when he was talking about just a lot of the stuff that could be, and I've seen it, I've seen a couple of, uh, I guess they were kind of memes, but they were uh, an image of Leonardo DiCaprio, and then they voiced over people's voices, and it gives you, like I said, that just kind of gives you that broad look, especially in this political that's what really scares me because we're already yeah. for AI. People will take verbatim what they see on social media anyway. And so when you start having the ability to put words into people's mouths tied with video, it makes a very scary thought of what, how things can really go. And that's why I say there's a, it's kind of the wild west now they definitely need to have a lot of regulations and a lot of lockdowns on just how it's being used. Um, Enrique, I mean, just in the artwork, you said your, your, your company is kind of trying to find a way in, in using it. Has that kind of, how deep has that ethical kind of conversation come up in, in the thoughts of how of course, the artists can feel one way, but again, the people that are running the companies are going to think something totally different, and they're thinking money and economics of, of yeah. and time involved. No, it's it's. I, I feel like when it comes to this discussion, there are almost two completely different discussions as of where, like you're saying, the voice recording and and trying to. It's almost like spreading media propaganda. Yeah, AI is a very dangerous tool, and that needs to be regulated. From from so far from our end, obviously, I'm just speaking from from the design world aspect of how we're using it. There's always there's a lot of uh, legal uh, things that we're we're making sure that it's not being used for where the artists are going to be, um, you know, completely replaced. It's more like you're talking about as a tool, like if we need a, a, you know, if there's like one scene, I, you know, we need to do, a, I needed to do a, a set, what's it called? A, um, you know, like a bleed. Extension? Yeah, yeah, set extension. And it was just like, you know, I was able to save, I've done this on my on my comics. So it was just like, you know, just, just save time. And I was able to just create that just that AI and to extend the set. And that was just so much, that's just saved a lot of my time and pressure and things. It was like, oh boy, do I want to do that? Do I want to spend so much time on doing something that I was going to just, you know, I don't, the time that I don't have, or, you know, this will create something for me as a, as a great base to start right now, everything AI we've been doing is more pre-production base. So it's just like, we still need our, talents, our skills to create, you know, the magic that we need to do uh, to what, you know, people want to see. So it's more like using it that way. It's just as, a, as we spoke before, just a tool to help us, uh, you know, uh, to make the best art we could be. But obviously, we were talking about earlier, it's just like there are people that are going to use it for, you know, for not the best reasons. Actually, one of the funny stories I forgot to mention, uh, someone me and Aubrey know, his name is Travis uh, Mangwing. He, was, he works at Disney and he was uh, reviewing uh, portfolios. And he and he said <laughs> a lot, like he caught some people where their entire portfolio was AI and they're applying to be conceptual artists for for Disney. This is insane. And this oh, is what they cannot do. It was like, imagine a client, a client uh, revision 
saying you do this AI thing, people didn't even think that that was not you. It was the AI. And now the client says, can you just move this character this way? That person would be fired right off the bat because <laughs> you cannot do it. It's like, I can't make. I mean, that's true. Yeah, yeah so... it is true. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff like that. Like I've heard that same argument too, where it's like change the color or, oh, yeah. you know, the prompt doesn't understand to take the exact same image and, and spit out just a different color or slightly different angle. Like those, those are absolutely true. Yeah. Like, are, I, I think, yeah. That, that, yeah, I think well, that's that. what scares me. And we talked about that Enrique before again, before that it, it moves aside the person that has spent years and money really learning the skill and the craft of art and design. That's what I don't like about it. You, like I said, you're you, obviously the person, that like submitted person the port, you know, the person that submitted the portfolio, again, there are going to be people that use it the wrong way and don't use it as intended. Now, if it was a position which you guys can, can kind of comment on, do you think more companies are going to have these kind of curated, oh, AI artist position um, as opposed to if he was trying, now it's totally wrong, if he's, and he would have been found out as a concept artist going into Disney, we don't use AI for that, and then having to sit down and, and do concept art when he doesn't. That's, you know, that's, I think, the, the, the thing that sticks out to me is a lot of people are just using it as a crutch to negate the ones that really have learned the skill of drawing and art and design um, and think that's going to carry them and keep them in this industry. I don't know if they're trying to necessarily start to get these companies thinking about, well, hey, you need an AI uh, artist position that just strictly deals with AI. Um, you know, what are your thoughts as far as it, it doesn't give them that skill of being an artist like you, Aubrey, or being an artist like you, Enrique, where you can sit down and draw, physically draw something and come up with a concept of something. Well, I think that's where I, I, I disagree a little bit with the idea of I would liken this to Photoshop. Because that, that argument, there was a lot of older traditional artists who drew on paper who were really freaked out about that time period. And we all have to face change nonstop. This industry is moving at rocket pace on what new tools, what new responsibilities that you need to take on in your position. Like that is always, always changing. And it can be really intimidating. And the, the pushback I would have on that is from Photoshop to traditional, like you still have to know how to draw. You're yeah. just learning how to do it with a different medium. You're learning how to do it digitally because that makes sense with where the industry has gone. Like we've gone digital. It takes up a lot of more time and resources to scan these images, put them in. Some places still do that. Um, but it's advancing the same skill sets. Like if you're a 3D modeler and Enrique, you're an awesome 3D modeler. Like you're still sculpting. You're just doing it in a different way. And like, I, that's where I would push back that AI isn't quite the same thing. Uh, the way that the wide public is using it, because you're right, like there's a new generation of people coming up who haven't learned the skill sets. They don't want to go to art school. Art, art school is expensive. And, you know, like AI, which is where we both went, speaking of AI, Art Institute is where yeah, we both went, <laughs> which is now, I think, only an online course. Like yeah. the brick and mortar places, I think, are predominantly gone. Oh. Um but art schools are really expensive and universities don't always offer, you know, you got to pick a specific university to go to that would even offer the same kind of education that, you know, yeah. that we had, for example, like you need to learn the skill sets. You, you have to put the hours in, yeah. you know, I myself to this day, like I still struggle with stuff and it's like, I haven't done like a figure drawing class in forever. And you have to stay on top of it. You have to fail. You have to mess up. You have to like go through the, frustration and the art funks to to learn how to work through it and with a new set of like a generation of new artists coming up who want to take those shortcuts they're they're like they're setting themselves up for failure because as, as Enrique pointed out like all right you submitted this conceptual piece 
um, of whatever, like a motorcycle biker, or whatever. We need you to draw that now. We need you to come up with different angles, with different colors, with different styles. And there's many artists out there who can absolutely do that. That's their job. Yeah. And these people who just come and use AI as a shortcut are like, sorry, like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> no, so, there's you know, a like a ton of people, like I said, that are doing, like I said, you, you already see it. I've heard examples of, you know, they're not writers, I guess, but they use AI to generate screenplays and they're, you know, they'll just take it yep. in like that. So there's, like I said, there's always going to be these, these ones that are trying to get a shortcut, trying to use the tool in the way I don't think it was meant to be used. I'm pretty sure the people that started, you know, AI and, and this whole trend were thinking something totally different, which I guess is why you had a group of them that really did kind of walk away from the company because they saw the writing on the wall of how companies were going to kind of run with it yeah. as opposed to taking the time to sit and think about, like you said, again, this broader view of how people are going to use it, and, and especially in how certain people will. You know, like I said, there's just always going to be that group, those group of people that just are out to use things the wrong way, out to do harm or out to deceive people uh, and take those shortcuts. Um, and so it's interesting, like I said, hearing the perspective of how companies today, like, I don't know if you've had, if uh, Aubrey, if Powerhouse has had this conversation about, well, how can we use AI or how are we going to use it or is it something that can be leveraged in some kind of way? Not to as, use it the as far as way, I, yeah, but to, to actually make the process of what you're doing or aid in the process of what you're doing easier. I think as far as I know right now, no, it is not something that they're exploring. I'm an artist. I don't know what the conversations are at the top yeah. tier of stuff, but the conversations I've had with, um, some of my superiors have been very anti AI, um, you know, because it's kind of what I spoke about earlier. It's like on one front, like the whole point of art in its broad spectrum is about the expressing the human experience. We're telling stories. It is at the base level. It is a human experience that we are communicating out there and to try to use a, there's, there's so many things that AI could be helpful with like someone made a good point about like, why are you replacing, why, why do you want to like, quote unquote, replace artists when, I don't know, fix recycling, <laughs> you know, fix these other broader term things that we could use true replacements of, use this technology to serve like a planetary purpose, Yeah, you know? Um, but I just, the biggest problem I see with AI, truthfully for me, there's a lot of conversations about it on, on people have arguments on both sides. And I think you need to have those conversations um, civilly, like Enrique is a dear friend yeah. and we've known each other for years and that is not changing whatsoever. We've been through too much and you know, that's, that's how it is. Um, but I, I look at the, the real problem I see with AI is the longer term where it's like, we are racing towards a wall that we cannot compete with the, I mean, you see how much content needs to be spit out. Like during the pandemic, where I've, where I've worked, like deadlines got like exceptionally more aggressive yeah. and to feed into that, it's just like, what are we doing? Are we eventually getting to a point where, yeah, you push a button and a movie spits out, like at a point, the quality of what gets out there is lost yeah. and there's going to be so much content. Like there, there already is so much content. There's amazing show like succession. I haven't even seen a second of succession. Cause there's so much material. There's so much other stuff. Like I haven't even seen Nimona yet, which is a yeah, show of animated a movie. Yeah, that's a great one. I was going to ask, I was going to kind of touch on it, but I did watch it. It's pretty I, good. I'm yeah. so excited to see that. Like I'm so excited and I haven't had a chance to, cause I want to sit down and watch that. But you know, there's just, there's so much content and we're in this big binge mode culture where it's just like a season's released and you can watch it in a day and then you move on to the next thing. Like, we're we're in this interesting moment where I'm like, we need to kind of slow down a little bit. 
Yeah. Well, where I see it though is like you made a great point. It's like people are making too much content, and they hope a push of a button is the answer of it all. It was, it's the real people are going to be realizing you can't just spit out things because quality is going to come down because yeah. people are going to rely on. It's almost like how, and this is where the difference where working in the design industry where there's amazing designers that they're there and they've been in this design industry for over 40 years and it's they're still on top of the game because of the knowledge of what they have of color theory of, of, of everything else that the traditional things you you just cannot replace and then there's people that are like photoshop people that just love using every filter they could think of that's going to help them just make something that they don't have any understanding of what, you know, the reason of what they're creating. Those people don't last long. Those people just will get, you know, they'll, 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 they'll have their moment and then they'll move on. And it's because you still need, and like, well, I mean, I'll, I'll be, I agree hundred percent. We all agree on this. Yeah. You always need to know the, the traditions of, of art, you got to know, you have to have knowledge to, yeah. of, of what is right, what is wrong to create the best product as possible. If, if studios are trying to go quicker, you know, they're going to find that we're seeing that right now, the, the, the work is failing. The, the, you know, people are just, you know, not liking the shows because they're not as great as they are when, because you're not using the great writers or anything like that. So it's, it's one of those things I, I just see, and I see this from 3D artists too. They use every little filter or plugin to make uh, a model, but it's just like you cannot replace someone with sculpting experience or or some kind of sculpting background to create uh, an amazing model. This is where I, I do agree. People are abusing the uh, the AI thing, where those people get found out, and and like I said, they're you know a lot of the younger kids are hoping that kind of thing will help them, uh, you know, not get educated in the art world. But then there was those people that are educated that they will have last for a very long time because that's just how you, you know, you, you exceed your skills. You have to always keep learning. You have to always keep using every little facet, you know, as just a tool, uh, to just elevate yourself. That's, that's how I see it. But from the broader spectrum, yeah, I agree. We should, you know, from the people, from the outside art, art world, it would be great for AI to be used to save the world or something like that. Because, <laughs> well, yeah, I think it, it's right it, now. Yeah, media propaganda is just it like has how a lot it's of applications. I, I think it has a lot of applications for good. Yeah, it just it's just, and obviously, you know, the creators were thinking about that. Well, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but I think generally, overall, they were thinking about how could this advance our society as a whole again like i said i think it's a genie that kind of got out of the case before they really you know kind of got it under control and it's yeah. like this river now or not even a river it's like yeah. a, just a flood that they can't control now um and unfortunately like i said the nature of how some people are they're just not going to use it the right way. I mean, I kind of keep coming back to that. Like you said, there's going to be artists out there that don't want to take the, the, the route of learning art, learning the skill of drawing. Um, so they'd rather go, okay, well, if I can just put in a couple of prompts and, and you know, copy somebody's style or mimic somebody's style, then, okay, I'm an artist now. Unfortunately, as we've seen, there are, gonna be, there are people out there like that. They're not. There are people that aren't writers or screenwriters. Okay, there's Chat GPT now. I can just put in the prompt of what kind of film I want and story, and but they haven't learned shots. They haven't learned how to lay out a screenplay or even put a story together that is cohesive. That may you can. Obviously, a screenplay writer can sit down and write and and pick. And it was funny because I was watching, and I don't know if either one of you saw uh, Quarter Quarter Cruise 
they did they wanted to see if they could make a an, a two D animated film using AI, um, in uh, I I don't know if it was any one particular artist style, but they just wanted an anime style, um, and it looked pretty good. But you could obviously see the quarter crew. It was decent. It was the yeah. quarter crew. Um, yeah. And it was decent. I mean, yeah. I don't think so. The cathedral animation yeah, thing. Yeah, the cathedral with the oh, two brothers right. and stuff. It was interesting. Right. They were just doing it as a test to see. Obviously, they weren't trying to promote or make money off of it. But you can. Well, see I it. think they seemed like they were genuine. Like they're. Yeah, they I were remember I watched the documentary on it. And yeah, trying to experiment. They used their to knowledge see. to try to get that. Was, yeah. yeah, and and they shot stuff on green, so they actually shot video and stuff that they were using so it wasn't like they just were typing a prompt to see it but it was funny because um aaron blaze had done a uh kind of like a review and he was sitting talking about it and he was just saying he could easily pick out the flaws in the 2d drawings and things like that but i guess the final thing was he took away he wasn't afraid of it or anything like that or just his thought was like most of us, how can we use this in, to aid us in what we're doing? It doesn't take away his skill. He knows he has a skill of what he does in 2D drawing and animation. So how could I use AI um, to leverage my creativity as an artist? That's the thing. People are skipping over, I think, that, that stage of being a creative and an artist and putting it down and they just feel like, okay, just give it some prompts and I can come up with something and now I'm an artist type of thing as opposed to learning the skill of what it takes to be an artist um, and the time and investment that is needed to be a, a good artist. And you, like you were saying, Aubrey, you're always learning. You're always perfecting your skill. There's still things that you're working on trying to get better at. Um, so I think that's the thing that scares me is there's going to be those those ones that just don't get it and are going to use it um, to benefit themselves or try and make money or try and get a job or get whatever it is. They're just going to use it the wrong way. That's yeah. the thing that really scares me about it. There are going to be people that use it in a bad way. I, I'm a firm believer that you can't keep a lie forever. You know, that's a, that's an old saying. There is a famous comedian, I don't know if you remember, Carlos Mencia. He, he in, in the 90s, he just skyrocketed. He even got as far as having his own television show. Then, then he got found out for plagiarism. You know, he was stealing mm. joke from every comedian, famous comedian out there. And it was just like, now his career is just... Nice. No one wants to do work with them. And it's just like, you know, and, it, and it's just, it's just, that's how I feel from it all. If you're going to lie about yourself being an artist, if you're going to lie yourself being a writer by using this tool, momentarily you're going to get found out. And then people are, you're going to lose a lot of credibility on it. As high as you're going to go using lying, is as hard as you're going to fall, you know, when you get found out. And that's how I see it. It's just like I, like you said, the, you know, me and Aubrey, we we love the tradition of it. And it's like I don't, yeah. from my end, from my end, I when I see someone that I know they're just full of shit. I'll just be honest. I'll just say it like that. <laughs> I'm not afraid of them because I'm like, you can get fired. I don't care what you say. <laughs> I'm curious, Aubrey. Do you think yeah. that that kind of plays into um, because now? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you can clarify it. I know uh, the VFX artists with Marvel were going after this unionization and trying to get unionized. Do you feel like that plays into um, the re part of the reasoning of why they're working so hard to get a union, which I definitely feel like is is a must because I think the VFX artists are really catching it hard in today's time. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I was just telling Enrique the other day, we, we both worked in a visual effects house for a while. And like, the hours then were awful, like yeah. bewilderingly bad. We would watch, you could see people like turning into shells of people, like, 
Wow. I mean, I can't stress how bad the hours were. Like, I think for me, my record was just like almost a hundred hours in one week. Like, wow. <laughs> I don't even want to think of what they are now. <laughs> like, I really don't. Like, my heart. I, I'm in a way, I'm kind of surprised that it's taken this long to unionize. I'm a fully support. I'm I'm in the union. I fully support them trying to unionize, because the thing that I think is unfortunate is they're starting to be um, not starting, but there's been a lot of um, criticism. You know, just speaking of the Marvel movies, there's been a lot of criticism to the effects in those movies. And I'm like, don't direct that at the artists because the artists are giving it everything they have. And it's the executives and the people who are making choices to say, let's put out four Marvel Marvel films a year. Yeah. Like that's, it, it's not like they're, they're just incredibly overworked. And so I do think it feeds into that issue. I do think that's part of it because... I, I agree with you and Rickery. Like, I'm not afraid of the people who come in who claim to be artists. They're going to have a moment, they're going to get found out, and then they're weeded out. Yeah. I am um, more afraid of the executives who see that as like cutting corners yeah. and like, okay, let's, you know, let's try making AI for an intro. Let's see how that is. And like, let's give the credit to artist, not any specific person, but like artist. And you know, I experienced that already in some projects. It's like, uh, <laughs> I was doing a uh, a, a vid. Well, I redid it, but the company used AI, they used AI to generate the video, they used AI to generate the audio, and it just looked, it looked terrible. But the thought was. They were rushing, you know, they just jumped on this AI bandwagon. Oh, we got to see how we can use it. We got to see how we can use it. You know, that type of thing. And then running with it. That's what bothers me is you got people that just, they're just running with it without even stopping to think, should we use it? Yeah. Can we, how can we use it? You know, in what areas? Um, and to your, your point, Aubrey, do you feel like, we as the consumers have a little bit to blame with that as well, as far as the the pressure of, on visual effects, because we're so used to VFX laden movies, and that's what we're expecting now. Do you think we play a part in that as well? Um, I I don't know. I think our eyes are a lot more sophisticated, for sure. Like, I mean, I have we have to remove all of us from this conversation because yeah. we work in the industry. We know it to spot. I think the general viewer audience member out there who doesn't have knowledge of this has learned to have a more sophisticated eye and they can call stuff out because it is used so much more. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of less is more, you know, my favorite horror films, some of my favorite, you know, films are from like, you know, you look at like stuff they did in the seventies, like John Carpenter, mm, who's yeah. like, I have a very limited budget. Like the thing was his big, his big like i get a blank check to work on this thing and he had a bigger budget but like i think the effects then stand up now yeah and right now like i don't i don't know i'm i'm not an actor but i have to imagine like it's harder to get into character when you're just in a green room <laughs> as opposed to like wearing the costumes and being in a cool environment where you're like yeah i can kind of feel yeah. like i'm in this space as opposed to like okay just to hold a green ball up here and I'm supposed to be talking to like a dragon or something like I but I'm sorry like to get back to your question like I think in terms of audiences like I, I don't know how much it is like I, I would definitely say that one a smart aspect of what the AI companies did to desensitize audiences to AI for example was stuff like Lenza where it's like hey pays seven bucks and give us six images and we're going to spit out half a dozen different avatars because most people who aren't paying attention, all they see is like, well, I don't know, a bunch of my friends have this. This is cool. I want this. I want to be in part of the conversation. I want to have something neat like this. I can't draw it myself. I'm certainly not going to hire someone to do it. So like, this is a quick and easy thing, but that desensitizes the, the wider public to this is okay. And I think audiences are already at a place in terms of film of like, I mean, audiences can be brutal sometimes. Like the critiques of some of the movies coming out, you know, the, the latest um, 
uh, I want to say Batman movie. It's the Flash, the latest Flash. Like I saw the animated mm-hmm. version of that story and it was amazing. I haven't seen the live action, but I know that that didn't get, you know, standing applause because we're just shoving this stuff out too much. Like the audiences have learned to devour content and to not sit with it and appreciate it for its art form. Like watch the story, appreciate it. And like, we're in an interesting moment right now. Like uh, Barbenheimer, like people are rushing to the theaters to see Oppenheimer and Barbie. Barbie and yeah, it's really, it's what, they're not more a billion Barbie? <laughs> yeah. like, they're making, it's, it's, a, it's a very cool moment if, if you wanna take advantage. I mean, we're in a strike. I think the CEOs are full of shit. Like, give the give the writers what they deserve. You know, let's not, yeah. you know, for oh, the yeah. actors, let's not have this ridiculous thing where we're signing away the rights for someone's image for the rest of eternity. You know, like, um, <laughs> we need quality and work. We need yeah. quality, and we need to slow down a little bit. And they've got to figure this out. Like, and there should be a law for that. You should. No one should have the right to use your yourself for for all reasons and, and, and for not asking questions. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Insane. Right? But, well, but going with the union part, I 100%, I, I, like, like we're saying, my goodness, it took forever, but at least it's happening because we've seen it. Me and yeah. Aubrey worked together in so many places where it needed a union desperately. And it was just like, okay, this is just poor working environment we, we cannot be pushed to the limits to where like she was saying working 100 hour weeks so it was it was it was, it was brutal and it was insane and and, and it's like yeah it, it was just a, a very you know sometimes i feel like uh you know especially when we were in the visual effects industry i feel like hollywood was like 10 20 years behind when it came to corporate ethics <laughs> you know it was just so many things that are just like that was just so avoided, but I'm, I'm glad that we're living in an era people are now speaking up, voicing out. And, and because of that, it's, it's creating a union now that will protect the artists. I'm, I'm hoping all for the best for it. And uh, we're, we were talking about, it'd be cool that this expands to become more of an artist union, because it's not just about the visual effects people. It's about yeah. the animators. It's yeah. about the designers. It's about all that. And, Absolutely. You know, strength, is, strength is in numbers. That's why actors were able to, all go. It's not like film actors have their own union and then television actors have their own union. No, all actors have their own union yeah. and, and, and all writers have their own union. So we should definitely think about consider having more of a, an artist union. That way it's, it's like you said, strength, strength is in numbers and it would help protect all and all assets of us. Cause I always do feel like we're like the redheaded stepchild in the industry sometimes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, is it hard? I mean, is that going to be a tough thing um, when you've got, like I said, studios that are making billions and billions of dollars off of this stuff? And then, you know, you're not even factoring in, which I think that was a part of the, the union. They're not even factoring in streaming and all the other things that are pushing out this platform, getting them money and revenue coming in. Yeah, you know, it's it's all, I think the industry is in a moment where we're acknowledging there needs to be change overall. Like artists, you know, yeah, these CEOs are making billions of dollars. Like that must be really great. <laughs> and it sucks for everyone to think like, oh, I have to give some of that away so that other people can make as much. Like, I don't want to make less, but like, why do CEOs make that much money? Why in the world should that ever be necessary? Just so you can go have four houses and a boat. Like, I'm sorry, I have no sympathy for the CEOs that make billions and billions of dollars. When I think I even heard a quote, and I don't know the accuracy of this, but it was like, the CEOs are making 300 times what your lowest paid employee is making. Like, why should it ever be that extreme? You know, like, we, we're in a moment, you know, the people, the creatives, the production teams that make the projects, you know, this is time that people are putting, we've, Enrique and I both know, we've known several people who have left this industry altogether because it is a wild and weird industry to work in. Yeah. Um, 
I have known several people whose relationships have fallen apart because of the crazy hours. Like I remember when I first met my wife, I was like, please don't leave me if my hours become really insane. <laughs> like, let's have a conversation. <laughs> but, it does put a lot you know, it, on a person, um, for sure. It's a lot of strain. When I left to get married, half the people in the department I was working in were getting divorced or separated. Divorced and spit. it's, it's a really, it's a really difficult industry to work with. You, once you get in, you, you figure out the nuances of it. And if it's your passion, like as a turn, in terms of a passion, like I don't bleak my eye at any of this stuff because yeah. you take away all technology, you throw me, you know, in the middle of nowhere and I'm going to find a way to create. Enrique, I know you're the same way. Yeah. When it's your career, you're like, I want to work someplace where it's not an incredibly toxic environment where I don't have to sacrifice, you know, my personal life to get the job done. I want to work on fun projects yeah. and with good people, you know, like that, that's crazy to think that's a big thing to ask for. But like, you know, speaking of powerhouse, like I've, I've been working at powerhouse for about a year and it is one of the best places I've ever worked. Yeah. Everyone is really collaborative, really positive, um, awesome leadership you know like it's not to say there aren't challenges there because every production has it um but you know well, <laughs> we all me, want to enjoy where we work well let me ask you this because i i don't know like i said it just seems kind of odd to me i know a lot of people that are looking for work or have gotten laid off let go um, but it seems like there's more and more content coming out, but I see more and more people say, oh, okay, I'm looking for work now. I'm open for work now type of thing. So it seems to me there's this kind of back and forth. And I, I was kind of posing this to a lot of other people. Do you see kind of studios going more the route of they have a small group of core people that are permanent employees, but the majority our contract workers that allow them to scale up and scale down when needed and let go when a project's done. Um, because it seems to be the case with a lot of the friends that I've been, been talking to, they're working on a project. Oh, this project was for a couple of months and then they're back out mm -hmm. on the job scene looking around again, but they're trying to get into studios in a permanent position. Are those, days of working for companies for like i said 10 15 20 years gone now or are you you know are companies going on the way of like i said trying to cut corners so of pricing and and just what they're paying out so they're doing contract where they don't have to maybe provide as much benefits or retirement account or those type of things i don't know how that kind of works in the space that you're in whether a contract worker is still responsible for their own things as far as health insurance and that type of thing or do you see that as kind of the norm that a lot of studios are kind of doing or is it still possible to get into these studios now and work you know 15 20 years and then is it partly because there's a big influx of creators now trying to get into making the competition even more that's a that's a good question uh when so i'm gonna go back in time on this when me and Aubrey first met i, I do remember it was uh the end of 2006 it was probably i think it was uh, october when we first met in 2006 mm -hmm. We worked in the, the Wayne's Brothers for a good, uh, what was it, year and some change, uh, I'd say that. It was like when we... You were there longer. You were there longer. Longer, right? It was almost two years, right? It was like around there. You, you were there longer. I was a little bit shorter, but yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was there longer. Yeah, okay. you were right. But when, I, when we left, that's when I had my first taste on how the visual effects industry was. And how it was, was, was that... Uh, people actually uh, uh, preferred to go freelance because they're able to kind of manage their hours. And so they did, there was a lot of boutiques. There was more boutiques then than there was now, but it was just like, they just, like you said, jump a job, got paid, you know, they, they did were able to, you know, put their rates where they're comfortable with. 
And then when their contract was done, they casually went to another place because they were not worried. I remember when I went to Creative Circle, there was over 800 job openings uh, from 800 students in Los Angeles alone. And then the recession hit. And, and that was 2008 yeah. and that took yeah. a huge hit where a lot of these small studios just plummeted and people were now looking for they couldn't do what they were able to casually do or just hit up a studio got paid some people i knew they worked six months of the year because they were able to manage their time that that way yeah. take a vacation two months because they could they saved up their money for all the freelancing and then come back whenever they please. That was before the recession. After the recession, so a lot of kids are watching, listening. This is this is uh, <laughs> uh, what the last uh, uh, you know while. Is but, this where uh, we know that we're old? <laughs> yeah, we're getting we're, we're getting not old, but we're getting up there. <laughs> getting up there, you know, back in my day, you know. So, uh, but then now because after the recession, studios were getting it was the large studios that are only ones survived, and then a lot of the small ones so people are now looking for full-time jobs as your question is it going to be back to where it was before the recession you know it would be cool you know where people can manage and their time a lot better and then go wherever they want you know that'd be a cool idea i don't know if it'll be possible i'm just saying you know because like i said i knew some friends that actually enjoyed it. they enjoyed that kind of thing but i guess this goes around to pay scale if they're willing to get paid yeah. a certain type of amount of hour, you know, for being a senior artist, they could do that. So they have that flexibility. I guess that's depending on studios because that's another discussion. There are, especially in the visual effects studio where they're underpaying and the gaming world where I've been hearing, they're now underpaying a lot of these um, amazing artists. So, you know, that, that, that where the, the future will take us on that. What you're saying, it's a great discussion. Is it going to, you know, is it going to be more small boutique studios coming up? If, it, if so, that would be cool. How would that be managed? Where would that evolve? I mean, it makes sense because we need content. Content is, is dire needed more than ever. Well, and you also get like, um, what I love about right now is in a sense, we're, we're in this interesting place because there is a boom that's happening. Like there's, you know, my focus is a little bit more specific to animation. This this goes beyond that. But like, there is so much content. And with that, that means there's a lot of opportunity to work on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like when we first got in the movie industry, like even before that, when I was that wee child, you know, like the idea of even being in the same town where they would have done Star Wars would have been like mind blowing. The idea that I got to actually work on them in, in, in any tier I would have like lost my mind, but the, the movies are so massive and TV is completely different. I mean, X-Files was what, like 27 episodes a season. And like now it's, you're lucky if you get eight or 10, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like the production quality is so high. And the fun part of that is that a lot of people have an opportunity to work on these movies and that's very cool. But I think the broader it gets, you know, that means there's a little less control that you have and the money's going a lot farther. Like the money doesn't go as far, I should say, because you're having to spread it out over such a wide, you know, you have to figure out a way of pulling back a little bit, but you know, like we're in this strange place because, you know, like Warner brothers had a bunch of movies that were in production, you know, like Batgirl just got axed. There was like a Scooby-Doo movie that was going to come out that was like almost done. And they were like, yeah. nope, you're done. So there's this this um, instability in, in the industry where it's like, well, now there's this idea that maybe I'm working on a show um, that even is, you know, has a good following and just gets axed for tax purposes. You know, like it's really unfortunate. And the idea of having boutiques is awesome because that means that you have variety of content in storytelling but also in style you know like disney has a very specific style and dreamworks does but then like powerhouse is another style and you know you look at spider verse which is like jaw-droppingly beautiful yeah. um and you see teenage mutant ninja turtles which is clearly drawing inspiration from there but there's all these different cool styles and that's the fun thing to explore but if you don't have um 
variety in studios, are you necessarily going to explore that? Um, and it's, it's just interesting. I think it is very rare to be at a place for, I mean, the longest place I've ever worked was five and a half years. And that was long. Yeah. Uh, everybody just jumping in. We are having just a, a very, very good conversation <laughs> with my friend Aubrey E. Duke so good. and Enrique <laughs> Uh, uh, so make sure that uh, so much so that uh, it's been hard keeping up with the comments here, but I do want to throw a few in. Please make sure that you do uh, comment uh, as well, because uh, I definitely want to hear from you for sure. Uh, Mr. Ken says, hey, again, appreciate you, Ken. Uh, Joseph, appreciate you stopping by. Big fan of Enrique. I'm pretty sure he appreciates that. Uh, for sure. Uh, Mr. Jerry, appreciate you stopping by there, Jerry. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, let's just not be naive. Uh, I think he was talking about uh, AI for sure. Uh, but we definitely got a lot of uh, great comments. Uh, and we are going to take a look in a little bit of some of their work, show you what they're doing. Uh, but I do want to ask you um, uh, both, um, kind of going back to what you just mentioned, Aubrey, this being such a great time, do you feel like um, it is going to take those those independent creators, um, kind of smaller studios, really making this big shift um, with more interesting content, more interesting stories coming out um, out? I think, um, I mean, all of this is obviously just like my personal opinion. I don't have as, for that, it's hard to say. Like, I think executives have a much bigger call with that kind of thing. You know, like, we're dependent on how this stuff is being put out there, right? It's, it's the big streaming studios. And that's dependent on what the executives' choices are going to be. You know, like, we it's all dependent on whether or not they're going to take a chance. You know, like Disney's the biggest company in the world and they're mm -hmm. doing reimaginings, which I don't work there anymore. So I am not a fan of, <laughs> um, I, I think that it's just like, you know, you, you need to take chances on, on there's less room for error, I guess is what I'm getting at. Like mm -hmm. if a movie bombs and it's like done, you've lost your chance, you're out. We're not going to do that again, where it's like, sometimes you need to fail. Sometimes there's there needs to be time for it to marinate, you know, like I think the thing bringing that back up, I think that did pretty bad when it first came out. And now like it's applauded Amazing. as like one of the best horror films there there is. Um, like sometimes you just need something to give it time to marinate. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, as a creator and in, in, like I said, you were saying put you anywhere you're going to be creative. Um, as a creative, I think we're all kind of like that, regardless of, you know, whether we have, you know, of course, people are are kind of going the route of, okay, I need to go to Disney or I need to go to Sony or these bigger studios to get my idea out. Um, and I always say this is a great time because you don't necessarily, if you are a true creator, if you're, you know, a filmmaker or an animator, you have this platform, YouTube, where you can build and connect directly with your audience yeah. and build your audience. And as a creator, you're not hamstringed by that. Of course, maybe a lot of them are looking at the dollars of what they can get um, on a it's deal true. from Netflix yeah. or Disney or whatnot. But I think it's a great time as a creator because you're not tied you don't necessarily tied and you can control your own idea you may have you may take a chance going to netflix having to adjust your story if you're a writer or an animator them controlling part of it i'm pretty sure if they feel like it's merchandise heavy if it's a merchandise cow they're going to try and work out something like that but as a creator you have the ability to see and trust your own idea of getting it out, you know, it's going to take a lot more work, I guess, putting it out yourself, 
maybe doing a Kickstarter to get funding, you know, to go to gra- grassroots level. But I see it as a great time now because you do have all these platforms. You can go to Roku. There's a lot of platforms where, or Tubi, I hear is being used a lot in this kind of groundswell of creators getting their content out there. I don't know. What are your thoughts on just that ability now to where you're not necessarily, I don't feel you're necessarily tied unless you're, like I said, wanting to get that kind of big budget thing um, and, and the dollars or the prestige of going to Netflix or having something done by Netflix or Disney or put out like that. But we're in a global, like I said, global stuff. I got viewers all over the world now that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about because I can jump on and do a live stream and, and reach a lot of people. Um, what are your thoughts as, as, as a creator? I feel like the, the power really is in your hands of getting your content out there. And trust me, I think if, if you are a, a say, a director or an animator and had an idea and put it out on YouTube and all of a sudden – Two million people are watching your webtoons or whatever it is. I'm pretty sure one of those big studios is going to come knocking at your door, trying to you know reel you in or get you to create something for them. How do you feel as far as these tools that we have now at our disposal of social media, these platforms that can, as a creator, you can get your content out there, Instagram. Be hands to really allow you as a true creator to just create and still control to some degree what you're creating. I'll let Enrique go. You've got your comic. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I do. Before I start, I want to give a shout out to Aubrey's brother, uh, Peter yeah, Duke. I've been following him. Oh. Yeah, he's Thank a you. super talented <laughs> yes. director. He's, he's a prime example. He has been making his own films and, and he's got a great following. And it's because, like you're saying, now thanks to media, you know, at first I remember back then before, you know, the YouTube thing was a big thing. He, he had to go to film festivals. Was that, was that right? He, he really had a yeah. kind of the old school way, you know, but, but yeah, thanks. He doesn't have an agent. He's doing it all on his own. Yeah, and, and, and but thanks to his perseverance and just how technology is, he could put it on YouTube, he could get all his work and still start building a fan base on there. It was a big inspiration, and that's where it was like for myself, yeah, the, the com- years as well, yeah, and for the comic book, it was just like, same thing I saw, I was like, well, actually, so how it started is I was just was doing it the old-fashioned way, I was pitching my book out to i'm not gonna name names but reputable comic uh, yeah. uh you know companies and and one of them actually responded and it was a, a very reputable one but the one of the things they said is you're going to change the story you're going to change the characters you're going to do all this and that and that was where i was like i've done this my whole career i said <laughs> yes to everybody <laughs> the last thing i want to do is say yes to something i created and so, yeah, I went my own route. And like we said, I'm great, you know, do my online comic, which is doing fairly well. It's got, you know, 50,000 views and, and, and especially in the Latin uh, communities is getting a lot of uh, support on it, which is amazing. And, and like I said, I, you know, I, I mean, obviously I'm not going to say I wish I was younger. I knew when this is all happening, but you know, I'm, I'm very happy that we are at a time that things are being like that, where you can be a content creator. And now you see people being discovered on the internet to now they're giving them a chance to create a film or something like that. It's more, to me, I find it way more, uh, you know, just just, uh, more pleasing that I could create my own content and have people see it. And rather than make money off of it. You're able to monetize it yourself. And like I said, you're not having to go through Disney or Netflix giving you a piece of something as opposed to, like I said, you can monetize your content now if you so choose to put in the work and and put in the time to do that and make great money. I'm pretty sure uh, I'm not a big follower of them, but I've heard like the Beast on YouTube. He oh, yeah. a lot of money, but he yeah. makes way more money and, and has control of his content on that platform 
there's a lot of great content creators out there now. I think I'm starting to realize they can they can generate money. Like I said, if you put the work in behind it and really, you yeah. know, put in the groundwork behind it and still yeah. control, have control of your own idea, your own IP, and not have to feel like it's got to be changed or sold in order to appease, a, you know, a boardroom or like a company. The- yeah, it's a lot like the music and it's turning little by little like the music industry where, you know, after the Napster thing and now things are, you know, yeah. <laughs> are, yeah, I are being and all that. And it's oh, like God. these, these yeah, they, but now the, the, these singers, now they don't they realize they don't need a record production oh, to tie don't. them down. They have the money they can make on their own, you know, and it's, yeah. hopefully it gets to that point. You know, there's an evolution. We all can see the evolution of the, the, this entertainment industry, especially for the artists, is is evolving. What's it going to evolve to? Well, obviously, we all hope for the best. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you're you're both right. Like, um, as independent creators or like a small group, like speaking specifically to like bands or like a group of people that are trying to push out a project, you're right. Like the 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 tools that are at people's hands now versus when we were kids are totally different because there's clearly content creators out there who develop enough of a following that the the bigger people start paying attention and, and might reach out to like, let's, let's do something with this. Um, no doubt that is um, the advantage that any uh, independent creator has is just like, if you, if you have the, the whys about you to understand the software, the streaming, the, the different kinds of, you know, social media platforms, you can take that pretty far. Um, and figure out a way to monotonize that. Like not, not everyone does, you know, there's so many different kinds of platforms out there and you have to, and then I've seen, there's like um, panels and lectures you can go to, to help people understand how to do that stuff. And I think that's, that's all awesome because it's, it's fun to see. There's, I've tried to gear my social media accounts to be aimed only at other people that I think will inspire me. So I'm, I'm constantly looking at other artists um, because I love the variety. I love yeah. the different kinds of storytelling and, you know, we get to have that now and it's constantly evolving. The industry's constantly evolving. And now that's something that the industry has to deal with and, and has to, for a little while, like YouTube and Vimeo and all these different kinds of, um, you know, to a degree, TikTok, like, I don't know, I didn't use TikTok, so I'm going to sound real dumb about that, but, <laughs> but it, it has, it has reach. I do know it has reach. A lot of people. It has it has reach. It yeah, has yeah. Like it's really reach. smart. Uh, so you if you are a way. content creator and and just are putting stuff on TikTok, you're gonna get seen because it just has and there's social platforms cropping up all the time, new ones. And like I said, I I love this time that we're in because trust me, I'm I'm probably around the same age. You know, really, really great. Um, so I know how it was before internet, pre-internet, pre-computer, all that stuff I, I get uh, because I grew up at that time. But just the reach now, like I said, that you got that you just didn't think about or even conceive of um, before. If, like I said, if you're a cartoonist, hey, I can... I can put out a cartoon and you know, web series my own self if I really want to. If I'm a filmmaker, like such as your brother, Aubrey, you know, until I get a big budget movie, if that's what I want, or if I want to be a small independent creator, there are avenues out there that I can do and, and put my content out there and it will be seen um, worldwide. And you just never know whose eyes are on watching your stuff as you continue to put put content out, I think. Like I said, I, I feel like it's a great time. Um, interesting time with all the stuff that's going on, like I said, with AI, that's but I still time. feel like it's a great time to be a content creator because I knew how it was before all of these tools such as Blender, Unreal, all these things that are available that to, to, to for you as a content creator to get your idea out there. And, and visualize your idea. Well, in certain tools, there are certain tools now that are easier for people to get a hold of. Like the Adobe Creative Cloud is expensive. Yeah. Um, 
and now there's things like in terms of like photoshop it's like you have procreate yeah that's like i don't know i don't know what it is now when i first got it, it was like four bucks and you have it for life and i use that gimp almost free. exclusively yeah i don't like, think gimp is still free which is yeah. you know like i said as a creator you can get this stuff out yeah, yeah. Uh, clip studio paint i mean that's what my daughter a lot of the young kids are using that and that's yeah ridiculously yeah. cheap I love uh, in comparison to others. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's more accessible. I, I love using uh, I'm using DaVinci Resolve now for my editing. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And, it, and, the, and the free version is just as good. Does pretty much 90% of what most people would use it for. Uh, if you like I said, if you're really heavy into it, and the studio version is a one time fee, it's not a subscription base or anything like that. So you got if you're a 3d person, can't afford Maya or, you know, don't want to get into Maya, it's Blender. There's all these tools that are just available. And I've seen some amazing shorts done and movies done. Yeah. Hell, Blender, they put out a movie every new version just to show what it can do. So you know the, the, the capability of what the tool is. And as a creative, oh, wow, I can use this to get my idea out and not have to pay an enormous amount of fees or subscription fees. So that's why I say sure. I like, it's a great, I like it. It's a great time to be a creator. Uh, we got a question here from Mr. DeMille. I don't want to uh, pass you up there, DeMille. Uh, I am an aspiring gameplay animator. Is there a real risk for AI to take over the specific genre of animation? We kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, I feel... I kind of... It's going to touch every, <laughs> in some form or fashion. Don't know how, but. Well, I would say for like anyone out there who's curious about AI, whatever whatever side you stand on, like read into it, educate yourself. Like that's the best thing you can do for anything. Like I, it's going to touch all the careers <laughs> there are. So like educate <laughs> yourself on what it is. Like instead of just using a tool blindly, Educate yeah. yourself on what it is, where it's come from, what its intention is, because those things are important. And I say, like, I definitely stress it much more so with AI, because isn't every sci-fi movie we've ever grown up watching warning about this very thing? Just, just for one, like, is this Skynet right now? But educate yourself. Like, as we were saying before, like, whatever your thoughts are about it, you need to know the traditional um, skills. If you're an animator... <laughs> be the best animator you can be and you know you got to just keep pushing forward you know if it's if you're passionate about it you you keep going and whatever happens with ai it's it's either going to burn out or it's going to be you know handled in such a way where there finally are the proper kind of regulations that should be around it that there could be and then i would say at that point when the regulations are in place and there's an ethical security around it the idea of looking at it as a tool is more acceptable but there's a long journey ahead for that and if you want to get in this industry you got to push anyway you know that's what we've done like there's nothing else i wanted to do i wanted to work in this industry and so you push through and you you try to learn what you need to learn to do what you want to do and you you know you know we went to art school but there's plenty of other resources out there to learn the skills and plenty of software we were just talking about that you can get into to start to learn the general like motions of things before you get into some of the different kinds of software. You got me scared now. I'm feeling like there's going to be a Terminator knocking at my door. Are you sure? <laughs> oh my God. As long as we got Keanu Reeves on our side. <laughs> 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 the chosen I, <laughs> it's, oh, it is scary. It is scary. I think it was the head of diffusion was even like, yeah, if you can't use uh, accessible data, go into private data. Like, go into the stuff that nobody is supposed to have access to. Like, yeah. the, the, some of the people at the head of these companies, like Civil Diffusion, are like corrupt people. There's been articles. Read, read. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm um, John Lamb has put out a lot of really great information about AI. Um, follow him if you haven't already. He's got yeah. a lot of really good resources. I'm going to try. Or they, it, I don't know, you know, pronouns. I'm going to try and find that uh, and put it in the show notes, that that uh, interview that Tom Billy did with uh, uh, 
director. Like I said, I cannot think of his name. Um, but he was just, like I said, talking about all the stuff. Because I think he was, um, he initially created it as a tool to help his son because his son was having some reading challenges. And so he was trying to figure out a way to kind of help, it, you know, um, enhance his son's speaking and reading. Um, it came from a personal personal thing but I, I thought it was like I said very interesting because he was just going through all of these scenarios of just where AI where he saw AI going and where it could go and all of that and you know like what Aubrey was saying I still think there's a lot of regulations and things that need to be put in place um, to really kind of corral this in because I do feel like it's a genie that's kind of got out, gotten out of the bottle that is getting very hard to control. Um, so very interesting. It's a lot. Oh, okay. uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. That's how I go. Oh, I was going to say it's a lot how America functions. Uh, I do remember there is a drug called a Fedra. I don't know if any of you remember Fedra in the early two thousands. It just they released it. And people, were, it was like a dietary supplement, yeah. and athletes were, and it was used everywhere. People loved it; they exactly. they believed in it. Deaths were happening; people were dying, like like in, in a fast, you know, amounts and large amounts. And it was like they didn't start regulating; it became illegal later. But it's like I don't know. That's how, sometimes that's how it works in the in this market. It's just like they'll release it. And then they'll start thinking about the, what we were talking about earlier, they start thinking about the repercussions later. And then things, like what Aubrey said, just start learning it now because sooner or later, you know, they will, they will start getting re regulated. But it, it's so odd how things like that work. It, it just gets released. They start seeing what's the pros and cons are, and then regulations start coming in. Well, it's yeah. the dollar, right? Yeah. If, if, <laughs> if this is something that has, has a multi-million dollar capability or like a potential then people are going to be like they all they can think about is the money i'm going to release this now many of this stuff like you know AI, i have no doubt that there's people out there who are just like one just exploring their skill sets of like i want to try something to automate you know a process that i do that is really annoying and repetitive or yeah like i have someone i have a personal connection with someone in my family that i think if i develop this technology can help them in their day-to-day -day lives i think there's a lot of like altruistic things like that that yeah. are worth exploring. Um, and then there are situations where a different person gets in control or the situation changes and this stuff goes awry. Like you need to have control over this stuff. Are you referring to yourself? <laughs> so, human nature, <laughs> human nature is there's gonna be people that, like I said, that's just the yeah. nature of ways some, some people think and some people move, choose to move. There's always gonna be you would, I don't think there's a product out there that you could probably, very few, that you could probably, somebody probably thought of a nefarious way of using it. So it's just, this is, like I said, I think a very, very, very slippery slope that needs to be, you know, um, handled very well. Um, and I am don't know about you, but I have very little trust in the government regulations and how they plan on using it. So I don't know. I have to wait and see. But I know how this, especially how this country rolls. So um, it'll be interesting to see how, how it goes. I, you know, like I said, I think the potential of what it could be used for, obviously, is, is good. But there are bad people out there, for sure. Um, <laughs> all this being said... <laughs> what what advice would you give to those younger ones that are looking to come in? I mean, we, we've said a mouthful about a lot of stuff, um, and it's unfortunate that, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it, it just seems like, obviously, this generation now that's coming out, they're coming out used to this technology and used to this way of doing things what kind of advice would you give to those ones that are starting to look into coming into this industry um 
Well, you have to learn how to walk before you can run, right? Like if, if you have a passion for this industry, I still absolutely think it is an industry worth getting into because whatever happens, like there's always going to be a platform where people want to tell stories. And that's the whole point of this industry, be it, you know, games, animation, film, like it's storytelling. And so I don't think that's ever going to change. I think this is an industry that has always gone through, you know, a roller coaster of, of highs and lows. And, you know, we're in a really weird moment and that's always going to be the case. It's an industry that you got to stay on your toes with, like learn the basics. If you love it, get into it. But just know, like with anything, I don't think this is even specific to this industry. If you love it, you weather the storm because it's worth it. And you learn through challenges. And if you're just looking to do this for the idea that it's easy, then like you're setting yourself up for failure. You gotta, you gotta make mistakes. You gotta encounter obstacles and you gotta fail. And all of those things make you stronger. So as you move through, you know, you feel confident as an artist and you get to do what you love. That's, that's the idea. And also boundaries. That would be my biggest thing that I would say to anyone is boundaries, work-life balance. <laughs> work-life balance. What would you say, Enrique? You know, um, Alan McKay. You, you remember Alan McKay's of World Renowned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen too much of his content lately. Yeah, he's kind, of been, uh, kind of been a hermit for, since the COVID, right? Yeah, Alan McKay. Yeah. <laughs> say hi. Hey, how you doing, buddy? So, uh, but he, he made a really good point. And, and this is where I stand by 100%, because he's been in the industry too for a long time. And and I'm sure me and Aubrey will you know, attest to this. Software comes and goes. Yeah, It, it, it always does. It, you know, when I started, it wasn't even Maya that was a big game name. It was Lightwave, you know, <laughs> right? You know, it was just like, uh, you know, software changes every, I say every five to 10 years in the industry. It's like what makes professional and this is where the kids need to understand because I hear this a lot from the from the younger audience. They stand by by the software. It's like no, a professional, is someone that's willing, that is you know willing to change as the industry changes. That's a professional. And and what Aubrey said is just like what makes a professional have a longevity is knowing the basics, knowing the traditions, because that will never die out. That will never get old yeah. and veer away. That would always stay. Your knowledge of what you need to know or what makes a good story, good design, good art, good everything, that will never go away. But what would always change is the software. Yeah. So that's where, you know, for, for the younger audience, if you want to step in the industry, have that mindset. Just know you're going to have to learn something new momentarily. Because if you don't, yeah, you will fall behind. And which we, me and Aubrey have seen too, is where people just wanted to stay in one specific way when things are evolving is just like i mean i already had to switch from after effects to nuke and it was just like and the, when we were working in the visual effects world it was just like something like well we got to jump on this or are we going to be left behind yeah. and that's to be fair i still my... use after effects <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, <love> <laughs> I was stubborn as hell, but I still buy. I still buy. <laughs> no. but, uh... oh, it's so true, though. So true, uh, and I am quite sure, um, Aubrey, your brother could make a film, a great film, on using an iPhone because he knows the principles of yeah. shooting. Doesn't matter what kind of camera he uses; he's a director, so he knows how to make a movie a good movie. Um, whatever tool he uses, I'm, you know, I'm pretty su- sure he uses great cameras, but I think he could make something just as great on an iPhone if somebody put that challenge to him because he knows how to put a story together. He knows how to edit it. He knows the whole process of yeah. telling a story. Um, so I, I'm in 100% agreement. It's not the tool. It's the artist behind the tool. You know, for sure. Um, who's going to be like, who's the next Steven Spielberg? Steven Spielberg is still Steven Spielberg, like, what, seven, over 70 years? Yeah. It's no. just like AI is not going to take over what is knowledge as a filmmaker. No, no, for sure. And, and True. Think, There's always new people to come around the corner. Let's take a quick look. 
uh, at some of uh, the work here. Uh, oh, Aubrey. You know, you're not going to. Yeah, we'll take over there for me. Thank you, <laughs> We're having some fun here, Hello. guys. Uh, but uh, they do. Uh, I so can move. It's fine. <laughs> I can adjust you on my camera here. So. Don, you'll get some critiques from Peter later. <laughs> oh, I know. I love that you guys are bringing him up so much. Peter Dukes, check him out. Yeah. He's my brother, he's been my biggest idol. He's the big reason why I'm in this industry. Definitely put oh, his, his link in the uh, show notes oh. as well. Like I said, I have been uh, yeah. checking out his posts and everything. Ooh, oh yeah, wow. <laughs> That's okay. No, no, I'm, I'm is, fine with it. This I'm is, good. Yeah. I got this is, Peter Dukes. She is not <laughs> Enrique, and that is not Aubrey. Uh, so my bad, people. Uh, wait a second. I'm gonna roll with it. It's live. Hey. Uh, Listen, yeah, we're yeah. okay with it. I'll walk in your shoes for a moment, Enrique. <laughs> uh, but we're going to show uh, Aubrey's work, which isn't uh, one with the beard. That's not Aubrey. <laughs> so, uh, she does some you have amazing, the long amazing illustration work for sure. Uh, like I said, this is a, a great piece. I like this piece, yo. Uh, Thank you. Does some great oh, illustration I'm work. Um, do you prefer? Um, on your own time, illustration, uh, or even on your own time, compositing. I mean, is your I, personal time just straight illustration work? My personal time is like straight illustration work. Yeah, like compositing has been the most through line I've had in my career. And I do love compositing because I, in my career in compositing, I've got to touch a lot of different kinds of stuff. Um, and I've really enjoyed that. But my, my personal time... Like my passion is always drawing and painting. Like that is the constant wheel that's in motion that every day I have about a thousand different projects that I wanna do. Um, so that's that's what I'm spending most of my free time doing is just is, is the illustration kind of work. Do you have um, your brother's storyboard stuff or do you? No, not so much. He's doing a lot of writing these days mm, and he's okay. a much more talented writer than myself. So I can't really offer my my assistance with that um we used to no, collaborate a he, lot yeah do, but when he puts out or when he starts to shoot his film um does he do storyboards or does he create storyboards from his or shot boards i guess you would call them from the uh you know the script each each project is different like a lot of times or there have been times in the past where i've I've lent some of my artistic skill sets to, to his work. We we haven't been able to collaborate as much as we'd like to in many years because the industry is a very demanding industry and I haven't had as much time to 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 give to that. And he's he's got a pool of talent that he turns to. You know, he's he's worn different hats on different um, different features. You know, he's he's got several of his own scripts that are in talks for like big features yeah. um but he's he's been mostly doing um script writing these days but he's he's a creative guy i mean ever ever since we were kids we were shooting films on whatever we could we didn't have iphones back then we were using <laughs> shitty it? old camcorders but it didn't matter like we were having fun doing it just telling stories and he's he's always done that he's got a really great eye for story you know he can rally people together really well you know he's a very you know, he's like a, you know, there are some people who are really in their head and they don't know how to express. He can, he can communicate what he's looking for and he's fun to work with. Um, and so he's, he's had the good fortune of running into great people who want to work with him. And, and, you know, he worked at a camera house for many years that gave him the ability to use some really amazing cameras uh, for his short films, which were his passion projects. And he's still doing it. He doesn't have a manager. He doesn't have an agent. He's not represented in any way and he's doing it all on his own. He's a, he's a full-time dad. You know, he's, he gives everything he can to his kids. And if he's got to get up super early or stay up late, he'll, he's writing. It's his passion. It's, it's what he is. The same with my art. Like it's the thing he just has to do. Yeah. Tell stories. Has to come out. Has to come out for sure. That was, like I said, some of Aubrey's great, great work there. Uh, let's take a look at some of it. Enrique's worked on some interesting projects. I didn't see the bag, but you know. 
Yeah, yeah no, it's it's uh, this is well, I guess I just posted most of the things that we've done lately at Bond, and uh, you know, it's it's, it's one of the pieces. Uh, you know, Little Mermaid was a huge one. So yeah. the designer was the owner uh, uh, of Bond, Patrick Dillon. He he designed this idea, and then oh, nice. you know, yeah, it takes. It takes a whole village for us to 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 make this poster, but for my department, we did the uh, <clears throat> the, the bodies, the CG bodies. When we first started this, this was a year prior before the movie released. We went just based off concept art. This is what I'm pretty proud of because we uh, we kind of nailed it pretty good on on the look of the bodies before we even saw the final CG. <laughs> so it was a great, I do want to also give a shout out to our friend, uh, Neil Massacla, because he's uh, one of our now, yeah, uh, Matt yeah. providers. He's still working yeah, to he's... get him on. Yeah, he's still working to get yeah, him on. Yeah, keep at it. <laughs> that'll, be a, that'll be a great one. Keep at it. He's, he's an yeah, awesome okay. artist and an awesome person. Oh yeah, amazing guy. Yeah. So it, it, a lot of these, you know, this one we got to work with the visual effects house of the Blue Beetle, so we were able to use the model. How how usually people don't understand how it works is that when we get stuff in the visual effects house, it's almost like getting a box of Legos. We get the box, and then you see the picture, but when you open the box, it just comes <laughs> in pieces. So it just that's how it usually comes when we get it from visual effects houses. So we put it back together, and this is stuff we were able to light and render from the three D department for Bond. You know, so this this is a you know this was a part we were well, I was very proud of as well yeah. because blue people. <laughs> yeah, I saw the trailer. It looks interesting. I mean, I know I yeah. don't think I was a Blue Beetle follower, but it looks like an interesting movie. So I'm looking forward to it coming out. Or Shazam, cool. love that. Shazam, you know, I've signed the same one yet, but uh, but you know, we were able to put together the dragon and, and you know, work with the art directors and all the other illustrators and finishers to get this piece. But yeah, a lot of the stuff we I, I enjoy doing at Bond is monsters. Mm. I, I love creating the monsters. This is another piece we did for Little Mermaid. Do you do a certain number of versions on the piece, or how many versions of the poster or the design that you do? That could go from hundreds to thousands <laughs> since we have a whole year before the movie releases. Okay. That's working on the clients and revisions upon revisions. You know, yeah, the, yeah, uh, your favorite one, uh, Aubrey Flash. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome this, one. I haven't seen that poster. That's a really good one. Yeah, at least this was, uh, we put the 3D department, we were able to work with the visual effects house to put together the bat wing for this poster. So we're very proud of that one. Nice. Nice. So, We've got a very talented team uh, I was able to put together. This one, I'll give a shout out to Dennis El Silvio. I knew that guy since early 2000s. I, I interned at Sony in San Diego, and I managed to hire him to build this uh, for me. And I mean, just just amazing piece. He just built this out of conceptual art from oh, scratch. Nice. Yeah, I, I like that one, really. That yeah, really. So, so shout out to Dennis. Uh, this is another uh, thing that Dennis built from scratch. It was the ring. It was pretty much just conceptualized and art directed in Bond, and they gave us this idea to build, and he just went at it. He's a master model. He's been modeling for almost 30 years. So it was just like, I, I can't, again, this is, as what we spoke, what, what skill can be replicated. I'm sorry? What software does he use? He's a, he, he's now more of a Maya guy. Maya. He, he, uh, it was it was great watching him because I thought when I for, when he showed me a little bit of his master class I thought he was going to use ZBrush and do hard surface and all this other stuff no he's, he just goes straight by and goes goes at it uh, just very knowledgeable about his shortcuts and so forth so this one's uh, I believe the art director is Sebastian Ruffney and then uh, I was the one that put put together uh, this Liu Kang model for this piece. That was that was a pretty uh, daunting task. <laughs> uh, we worked. I worked at the CG house, but I had to really make it work for for us to to render out to use for the advertisement. That took about two weeks to put together this Liu Kang guy. So it, was, it, was, cool. it was quite a it was quite a quite a feat. But it was it was one of my favorite pieces. I'm gonna buy that game obviously when it comes out. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, I, I'm curious. Do you? How do you? feel about or how do you kind of uh, approach 
learning new softwares or moving, you know, do you, with your schedule, have the times to really kind of dabble in different softwares or is it not worth, you know, really your time? Maybe you can, you know, both kind of answer that a little. You know, for me, I, I use, I guess, because this is just the way I look at I, I use what the clients use. So if, if industry standard is still Maya, not Blender, then I'll stick with Maya. You know, it's, it's whatever is an industry standard. I like to try to dabble as much as I can, but there's so much, what is it? There's like hundreds of softwares out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot to, to try to learn for sure. And, and I'm like Aubrey on my free time. So I, I do like to stay away from all the softwares and just stick with traditional drawing. I, I, I love just doing that on my spare time. So it's, it's, it's one of those things, right? You just have to learn to find time for all of that. You know, I, I, whenever we learn the software, it's just, we always talk about what makes sense for the project. So that's how I learn the software. It's mainly for the project, what makes sense for that, you know? And then we'll, we'll utilize it. Obviously, I always try to keep reminding myself the first time using it, it's never going to be the perfect uh, <laughs> execution, but the more you use it, you just get better at it. Yeah, never. It's never. good to be versatile because different studios use different software and, and whatever the software is, it, it's whatever makes sense for the pipeline that is already in place. You know, like, uh, you know, Enrique and I, when we were working in visual effects, we were both working out of After Effects. It's what we were used to in the studio transition to using Nuke. Um, so that was something that we had to learn how to how to use, and I've used it a lot since then. But I've also kind of tic tac back and forth. It all depends on, on the production. You know, compositing uses a lot of different kinds of software. We have main ones, of course, that are a little yeah. bit more consistent across studios, so you don't have to... I don't want to give the impression that it's like I have to know 12 different pieces of software. I don't, but yeah. it's to your advantage to know what the main software is and to do your best to understand the basics because your knowledge is going to be transferable, but yeah. it's good to be as up to speed with the software as possible so that the, the knowledge you have matches the tools you're using. Um, it can be daunting at times because of course, like the, the industry is consistently evolving um but your your base knowledge will carry you far you just have to have patience yeah. and hopefully a, a collaborative team like you know the, the best part of being in a team is to share knowledge and to you know it's great to have mentors and it's great to have people who are willing to to learn you know i've worked at places where you know I've had people who were supposed to be leading me who were just like, I'm going to tell you this once and then don't ever talk to me again. And it's like, cool. That's I'm real glad to be on this team. That's a scary <laughs> thing to think about for sure. Oh, yeah. oh man. But, um, we're, uh, there's a lot of stuff, you know, coming out. We've seen a lot of great uh, ones uh, that have been released, some that are, you know, coming out. What are some of the ones that, uh, you are excited about seeing uh aubrey you said you hadn't seen nimona yet um, i know i know i will the, i promise creators uh, <laughs> some of the uh, obviously uh disney just released not too long ago kijaji moto which i definitely want to check out so there's a lot of great I'm, um things same. that are coming out what are some of the ones that you're kind of excited about or heard about that you would man, i don't really want to see this and love to check it out um, I mean, there's a lot, you know, in film and in animation, you know, just sticking to that, like Nimona is one that I've been wanting to get into. I'm, many of us are waiting for the next season of Arcane to come out. Oh, like yeah. that show was incredible. Love the style. Um, you know, Invincible, waiting for Invincible to come out. And, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's, a, that's just the thing. There's a ton of content. So I'm, I'm excited for all these things because they're, you know, that we're going to go see the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie tomorrow, um, yeah. which I'm really excited about. I've heard great things. Yeah. I read an amazing article that, you know, Seth Rogen was interviewed and said that he he made it a priority to make sure that his artists, you know, didn't kill themselves on this project, essentially, that they, they got to work 
you know, as regular hours as you possibly could. And, and yeah. that's sort of an interesting concept now because so many of these movies and not, not, not just movies, but so many of these projects are dependent on this is only going to get done if we work in saying OT. And that's yeah. not really how that's supposed to work. You know, OT technically is supposed to be a penalty against the company. Like, okay, yeah. if you want me to work more, you got to pay me, pay more. me more. But, yeah. yeah. You know, we, we, I would hope we can figure out a better schedule. We've, we've already talked about that, but, yeah. but there's a lot of cool stuff. You know, the new, the new Dune movie. Can't wait for that to come out. Like awesome stuff coming up. What about you, Enrique? So there, this one's a movie that released, but because I was talking to Neil about this, it's like, you know, remember how back then, you know, kids don't understand these days how some of the comic book and video game movies ruined their childhoods back then. <laughs> the movie I'm talking about, and when I saw it, I was like, my goodness, this is an amazing movie. I wish I saw this uh, when I was a kid, because the one we had ruined my childhood was Mario Brothers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> John Leguizamo, the live action one. I was like, "What the?" Oh man! Like, what the I mean, when I was a kid, I was I was such. A, I'm still a big Mario fan. And then when I saw the, the movie, I'm like, "What the hell?" I was like, "I was like, you know, I was like, this isn't Mario. This, oh, man. <laughs> this is a passenger. No one wanted to see a live action version of that. No, yeah, no." <laughs> The fungus looks just like The Last of Us show, too. It was hilarious. But, yeah, the, the new Mario was done really well. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm like that. I'll see some, like, some just doesn't, don't translate well. Or you should just <laughs> leave them as they are. Um, I saw, uh, I don't know, he's supposed to be doing a uh, um, another animated uh, film, but I'm a I'm a big Bloom County. Uh, the comic strip. You ever read Bloom County? Um, but they did like a Christmas. He did like a 2D Christmas, and it just didn't work for me. And I don't know, maybe because you know you 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 read it, and in your mind you're already giving the character voices and a personality kind of way, oh, yeah. and then when they do it, it's like. That's not how he sounded in my head, you know, type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Scooby Doo was the same way. I didn't really like the, you know, the the live actions of Scooby Doo. I was like, oh, uh, I see. Works better in comic cartoons for me, but I don't yeah, know. that was hard because I love Sarah Michelle Gellar, and I was just like, <laughs> hmm. I'm the same. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <clears throat> and that may be, and I think that part of that, I think, like I said, just. It comes from companies just wanting to make money, you know, as opposed to does this really work or should I really make this into a movie or, or whatnot? You mean you don't think Popeye was great? Robin Williams was Popeye? Wasn't <laughs> was, I thought he played a, a, I thought the characterization was, it was a horrible movie, but, you know, <laughs> he did a great impression of Popeye, you know. Yeah. I weirdly just randomly saw a few minutes of it the other day. That is the absolute most insane thing to watch now. As a kid, I remember it was kind of weird watching it. Now it's just like I don't, I don't know what anyone was thinking making this movie. Well, I think when you go back and 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 really, like I said, go through a lot of the comics that we or the cartoons that we used to watch, it's like okay. Now I was a big. Uh, I still like his his. Um, you know, cartoon, Tex Avery. But when you all go back and watch it oh, now, yeah. like, ooh, that's pretty <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's the biggest hurt where you're just like, whoa. <laughs> I watched this. pretty racist yeah. there. Uh, what so, messages you know. are being put into our minds? <laughs> so that's why I said it's got the power to really, you know, indoctrinate you in some kind of ways. So we should be watching it now. But like I guess it that. It lets you know the power of of story and animation and, and what it could really do. So, the amazing, amazing yeah. work. And I'm gonna jump back over here. Uh, everybody, like I said, forgive me for this has been a great conversation. I usually tend to like to go back and forth with the audience and keep them interactive, but this has been uh, one of those kind of talks where I hope you got something 
uh, a little bit of something to think about uh, because, like I said, like Aubrey was saying, you definitely need to educate you, H- educate yourself on the implications of what AI and all that we've talked about because I do believe this is going to be around for a while and this is where the kind of, I won't even say just specific industry because, again, this is touching not just the art industry or the film industry. This is touching a lot of different spaces. So in whatever space that you're in, you need to educate yourself on. I still feel, like I said, this is a long way to go when it comes to regulations, the ethics of what this this um, medium can do. Um, and really getting a good grasp of it because I know how, like what we talked about, companies and people can run with this and and really take it in a direction that it really shouldn't be going. Um, So make sure that you do uh, educate yourself on just this nature of the time that we're in now. Oh, excuse me there, Aubrey. I didn't mean to switch to this, but uh, I appreciate you being on it and kind of... It's like my job. I have to be on my toes. <laughs> make sure, make sure that you connect with Aubrey. Uh, check out more of her work. She does some amazing, amazing work. Not just in uh, the Thank stuff you. that she does with Powerhouse, but just even in her own uh, work. You can connect with her on Instagram, LinkedIn. Check out her art station page um, and the website for sure. And again, all this information will be on the show notes so you can definitely uh connect with her there uh and find out information there as well uh mr enrique this was a little, lot easier he has a link tree so you can connect with <laughs> just go to his link tree page stop outdoing me enrique i got an emmy i've got a link tree i get it <laughs> i'll get a link tree too and maybe an emmy i don't know <laughs> I got it makes it so much more convenient. I, 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 I'm with you, Enrique, because I got work too. Just go to his uh, link tree page. There you'll be able to connect with him on all his social channels. Check out his webtoons uh, as well. Uh, but make sure that you do reach out um, and connect with them. Again, all this stuff will be on the show notes uh, for sure and everything that we talked about. Uh like I said, I always, always, always enjoy when, like I said, family members come back. And I can't thank both of you enough uh, for coming back on and making this such a fun uh, episode. I, I'm sorry, Aubrey. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a thing now. We just do it. <laughs> making this a fun episode for sure. Uh, and, and as always, can't wait to get you back on because I know – there's always new stuff coming out from you guys. Um, so I just can't wait. Um, I'm always following you and, and checking out the things that you're doing. But I cannot thank you enough for being uh, a Color of Motion family member for life. Uh, and um, oh, I'm definitely yeah. buying a T-shirt, too. So uh, No, those are, like I said, yeah. those will be coming yeah. to you uh, within the week. So, you know, uh, just make sure, like I said, when you do get your swag, make sure you take a picture of yourself. Because at that time, okay. early on, you know, when you were in your first season and, and when you were on, I hadn't started giving out swag to the guests yet, but that was something that was in the process. So I'm having yeah. to go back through all of my guests now. <laughs> so, so well, thank you so much. That's awesome. It's, it's a yeah. slow process. So for all you uh, guests that were in first season one and all that, give me give me some grace. I'm catching up to you. I'm trying my best to get myself caught up. I got 129 guests to get through, uh, and I'm not able to do it all in one while. So <laughs> uh, you will be getting – everybody will be getting their swag, you know, items. And I, like I said, as part of the Color of Motion family, like I said, it's – I can't thank you enough for for just coming on. And one, like I always say, being my friend. And two, for coming on and sharing uh, with the community. Uh, Miss, I don't know whether this is Mrs. or Mr. Cafe Bistro. Showing you some love there. I appreciate all of you 
uh, that are always uh, supporting of the show and being a part of the show. Like I said, I cannot do this uh, without one, you, the viewers, and two, my friends, for coming on to the show and uh, being a part of it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. DeMille, love the Flash poster. Love the work. Definitely make sure you connect with both of them. Check out more. This was just a small fraction of what they are creating. So if you're connected with them, you can definitely, uh, you know, check out more of their stuff. Uh, if you both could hang out in the green room for just a second while I close out the show, I would appreciate it. Uh, but everybody, again, please help me uh, thank uh, my very, very special guests and friends, Aubrey Eden Dukes and Enrique Torres for stopping by and blessing us with their presence. <laughs> Hang on just a second, uh, guys. I will be right with you as I close out uh, this uh, fabulous show. All of you, this was, this was a, a great talk. Because like I said, I definitely wanted to dive into, uh, you know, the AI talk with them. Uh, because uh, I know, you know, they're good friends with each other, so we could have a really good talk um, and a really uh, true, honest talk about it. Uh, and you see uh, both their perspectives uh, on it uh, from an artist's perspective. So I thought it was a very great conversation, and I hope you, as the uh, viewer, got some value out of it. But like Aubrey said, make sure you do your homework. Just Get up to speed on what AI is all about in whatever field you're in and how you can uh, leverage it, what your thoughts are on either side of the, the spectrum. I can't thank you enough uh, for, uh, again, joining me uh, for this uh, you know, great episode. It's been a fun one, for sure. Uh, and next week is uh, no exception. We got a great guest coming on next week. Interesting one for sure, not without its little hiccups, but uh, like I said, that's the nature of life. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, have an even more productive week, um, and I hope to see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>